What is a confession? Are they all true or are some less true than others? I'm Dan Ringer and we'll talk about false confessions right now on The Law Works. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Closed captioning for The Law Works is made possible by a grant from the Monongalia County Bar Association to support legal information and education for all West Virginians. The Law Works is made possible by major grants from the Office of the West Virginia Attorney General and from Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975 which provides high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems as well as PC-based systems, and by a grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation. The West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and justice system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. confess to something they didn't do, or do they? My guests are West Virginia University law professor Belina Beatty and from the Innocence Project, attorney Ifeoma Ike. Ladies, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. How did you, how did you get in, interested in the subject matter of false confessions? Uh, well, I'm the director of the West Virginia Innocence Project, which is a legal clinic at the WVU College of Law. And this has been a particular interest of ours in recording interrogations to avoid false confessions. Uh, from my own personal experience as a prosecutor, I know how helpful recording can be. I was a prosecutor in D.C., and D.C. has a requirement that all interrogations need to be recorded. So it's a very useful tool as a prosecutor to have that and to have the defendant's own words. Now that I've been doing instance work, I also am able to see how not having recording, failing to have recording, really can lead to a wrongful conviction. Ify, how did you get interested in false well, confessions? Um, first, thank you for having me here. I am a policy advocate at the Innocence Project in New York, and um, I am more of a policy uh, reform uh, wonk, if you will. Um, one of the issues that we are working on is improvements um, within policies and procedures that would help prevent wrongful conviction. You also worked uh, for the House of Representatives. I did, correct. In, in much the same areas. Uh, so identifying issues like this are something you've got quite a bit of experience with. That's correct. So uh, while I worked uh, in Congress, I worked for the late Congressman, uh, Representative Donald Payne, and I, then I also subsequently worked for the House Judiciary Committee, um, specifically with their Civil Rights Division. So um, in the realm of civil rights and ensuring that we protect all persons and the public, um, we've, I've worked on issues in the past including um, racial profiling, um, better policing, um, laws that may or may not lead to disparities for uh, communities, for particular communities. Um, so in a lot of ways, this work is an extension of that work. Um, I came to the Innocence Project because I was interested in what they were trying to do on the policy end, and uh, specifically with, uh, with wrongful convictions and what can we do with law enforcement, legislators, um, even just community leaders and, and citizens, the public, to uh, better improve techniques that would hopefully lead to uh, less uh, innocent people being convicted. The Innocence Project originally started out identifying people who had been wrongfully convicted of crimes and trying to get those convictions reversed, eliminated, or get the people set free for by whatever mechanism. But they have, over the years, kind of expanded that now to look at the causes of incorrect convictions or improper convictions. That's correct. Uh, most people know us for uh, the litigation work uh, that they do. Um, as you correctly stated, uh, we uh, have successfully worked on cases using DNA 
to uh, show that there are in fact individuals that are in our prison systems that um, are in fact innocent. Um, to date, we have 311 individuals that have been exonerated through the efforts of the Innocence Project. Um, and there are also other groups and, and attorneys um, who work very hard in the nation to exonerate individuals um, every day. And, and some of these people who have been exonerated because scientifically it, it has been demonstrated that it could not have been that person who committed the crime of which they were convicted confessed to committing the crime. That's correct. Uh, we we do know through um, DNA cases, which we should also, um, as Valina knows very well, represents a very small number of cases that actually that we can actually work on. But with, through our DNA cases, 25% of those cases involved false confessions, and that's pretty high. Um, so what we do know is that while it it is uh, somewhat counterintuitive to many, there are people who, in fact do confess to crimes that they never committed. And several, I would say many, of the people whom the Innocence Project has been able to help were on death row. They were waiting for the hangman's noose, the needle, or whatever the mechanism was in that particular state. So you actually pulled them back and ultimately got them released. Now, it's not simply a matter of saying this scientific se test says, for example, the DNA wasn't that person's and they get released. There's a complete evaluation of the case. There may be other evidence that still would support a conviction of the person who's in prison. But they put all of these things together, you evaluate everything, and sometimes, as, as might be said, the icing on the cake is a scientific test that says not only is it arguable that this person was the one who committed the crime, but here's a scientific test that says it wasn't that person. And you highlight a key point, I mean, why, Valina and I are here is largely to emphasize that, um, you know, the ultimate uh, price, I mean, that we all have to, to try to avoid, um, I guess, occurring in the future is the price of life, is the price of, you know, taking somebody's liberty, of course, but also just taking somebody's, depriving one of their life, um, to then later find out that they did not uh, uh, actually do the crime. Um, <clears throat> but what is even more troubling are these cases where individuals confessed to a crime and it makes you wonder, well, you know, let's let's take a step back and look at what caused a confess what caused an innocent person to say, I did a crime that would ultimately lead them to lose their life. Well then let's ask that question. Why would someone confess to something they didn't do? Well, there are there are a couple of reasons. Um, we're still learning factors that lead to false confessions. We do know from the 25% of those 311 exonerees that there are four major contributing factors, um, one of which is just intimidation um, and fear, or the perception of fear. Um, and which, which is clear to point out that a lot of this may just be how an individual who's being interrogated feels when they are being interrogated by a police officer. Um, closely related is the fear of feeling that if one doesn't succumb to certain techniques or does not admit to a crime, that, th that the lack of a confession would lead to a harsher punishment. Um, because they didn't cooperate. Because they didn't the cooperate. Police. They're scared of what the consequences, the unknown consequences may be. Um, and another reason is really the the capacity, the mental capacity of that individual. And that doesn't necessarily just mean mental illness. Um, you could be under a lot of stress. Uh, you could be fearful. You could be under a controlled substance. Um, there are a lot of uh, factors that could cause one to, uh, cause one's mental capacity to be diminished. Um, the, uh, the final contributing factor that we know um, has played a part are interrogation techniques. And that is an area that we're trying to work on to improve. Uh, we know that this is not necessarily about bad cops all the time, and this is not all, 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 this is not always about uh, coercive techniques as much as it's about techniques that have been accepted as common practice that even cause, um, they're so good that they cause 
innocent people to say that they've done something they haven't what, done. What kind of techniques are we doing? We don't waterboard people in police stations typically, at least I've never I heard of not. that, but <laughs> what kind of techniques are involved in that? Well, um, let's take the, the, there's a really good example, um, Officer Trainum, he's, he's an officer who now is an advocate for uh, tools that could um, help this, this issue of false confessions. Um, he was a cop who he would describe himself as being um, very calm. He didn't, um, it was a murder case. He was with what he thought was the, the perpetrator. And he uh, went through a line of questioning. He wasn't, it wasn't for an extensive amount of hours. It was just uh, techniques such as, for example, um, utilizing cops are allowed to utilize key facts that exist in a case and, you know, use them, uh, manipulate them, if you will, but use them um, as they're interrogating witnesses, suspects, um, with the goal of soliciting more information that would help them with their case. Um, what that sometimes leads to, it, it may lead to confusion for the person that is being asked the question. Um, it may lead to an individual, um, it, it may lead to an individual adding to the, the information that was introduced by the officer, which could then later be incriminating for that, towards that individual. Um, in the case with Officer Trainum, he stated that it wasn't until he looked back at a recording of his interrogation that he realized that he actually was feeding some answers to the, what he thought was the, the suspect, and she was literally repeating back to him what he stated. Um, and if it wasn't for that tool of a recorded interrogation, he wouldn't have been able to see that, and she probably would have been convicted of first-degree murder. We're talking about false confessions. My guests are West Virginia University Law Professor Valina Beatty and from the Innocence Project, Attorney Ifeoma Ike. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. So he was essentially leading the suspect to say things. It's, it's, these are called leading questions, basically. Leading the suspect to say things that she otherwise wouldn't have been able to say because, because he essentially told her. That's correct. He introduced um, most of the key facts in the case, and she then had um, had basically repeated that, and that's what was recorded. Now, if we think about evidence, for example, in a, in a courtroom, um, had there not been recording, um, it, we would have largely relied upon the written statement of the, the uh, perpetrator or the suspect, and probably also the, the testimony of the officer, which is very strong in a courtroom, would be very hard for an individual to then say, you know, I did not do it, when you have a statement and you have um, a person that you did, in fact, repeat those, those facts to. I saw a trial one time where the attorney stood up and said to the jury, you heard the defendant say whatever it was was represented to be said. And the judge snapped his head up and said, excuse me, the defendant didn't say that. Mm -hmm. You, the attorney, said it. The defendant merely agreed with you. And I've, I've thought about that over the years several yeah. times. There's yeah. a big difference between me, for example, mispronouncing your name. And you're a kind person and you may say, well, I'll forgive that. And you say, yes. Right. It's not correct. You agreed with it because that was the easy route to take. Most people, when they're answering questions, want to give answers that the person making the, they're asking the question wants to hear. We try to please people. And sometimes you just shouldn't do that. You should restrict yourself to what is the truth. And with law enforcement, you're particularly, you're in a high pressure situation where you're trying to please law enforcement as well. So it's, it even has that added impact in that situation. And it sometimes depends on who the police officer is that's asking the questions. I had a client one time who in fact had committed the crime that he was accused of committing, but he was interviewed by a local police officer and they said, would you like to give us a statement? He said, no. So the sheriff's department got involved and they said, would you like to give us a statement? And he said, no. So a West Virginia state trooper came to him and said, would you like to give me a statement? And, and he said, yes. 
And so I said to him, you know, you were doing really well <laughs> up to the point where you were interviewed by the state police and then you confessed. Why did you do that? And he said, well, they're the state police. You have to talk to the state police. Mm. And many times over the years, I have seen federal officers come in and, and someone says, well, I, I have the right to remain silent, but this is a federal mm. cop. I've got to talk to the feds. Yeah. Uh, and that's not to excuse them for committing their crime. It's just the, the mechanism by which people will say things depending upon the importance of the person asking the question. Right. I, pretty sure that if the President of the United States called you up in the middle of the night and said, I want to ask you a few questions, you would say, okay, go ahead. But if I called you up in the middle of the night, you might not be quite so kind to me uh, because I'm pretty much nothing in that world. Well, and particularly if you're under arrest, you haven't committed the crime, you know you haven't done it, but you're in this scenario where you've been questioned for potentially hours, you're trying to help law enforcement and you say things that then can be taken out of context and used differently. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons recording is so important is that it gets the whole story, really records the entire interaction. And in speaking with uh, local departments and the departments around the state that do have recording in West Virginia, and that do record the entire interrogation, they found it incredibly helpful to have that whole interaction on tape. You've, you've talked about recording a, a couple of times, and that is, in fact, the Innocence Project, both nationally and, and here in West Virginia. That's one of your goals, is to have statements taken by the police recorded. Absolutely, to have uniformity across this state and have uh, that same security in each police interaction, in each police station. And it's not just security for the people who are innocent, who are brought in. Uh, it's really also to protect law enforcement. And speaking with law enforcement about this, some of them have compared it to the cameras are, that are now in their patrol cars when they do traffic stops. And that having that recording protects them from allegations that they used force, allegations that they said particular things that they didn't. And that same protection uh, then can occur and be applied in the interrogation setting as it well. It can also cause the police officer to reconsider whether the person that they see as a suspect should be prosecuted. If he, you gave the example of the officer who went back and looked at the recordings and said, I didn't hear what I thought I heard. And I have seen myriad cases where, especially in DUI stops, uh, a lot of towns now have cameras in the cruiser and when they bring the DUI suspect out to give field sobriety tests, we'll put them in front of that camera, say do this, do that, do the other thing. And afterwards they go back and look at the recording and they say, you know, it's not real obvious that that person was drunk or under the influence or it's pretty obvious that they weren't impaired. And sometimes it, it helps in the sentencing phase for the officer to come in and say, okay, he was drunk, here's the tape, you mm -hmm. can see he fails the field sobriety test, but he was very cooperative, he was not antagonistic, uh, cut him a break. I mean, that's, the, the, oh, sorry, that, that's yeah. what's so important about um, having a tape, right? I mean, it's an archive. We do not mm -hmm. have to rely on an anecdote, we don't have to rely on subjective, um, or too many subjective views as to uh, what happened as far as with you know, trying to reinterpret the the actual interrogation process. Um, when it comes to the court, there ultimately will be a determination of actions, but what's so great about having a tape is that you don't have to spend so much time, you know, interrogating the police officer or even in a situation where a defendant who wants to, you know, invoke their right to not testify um, during the case, they at least can have some type of comfort that there is something there that represents what actually happened and what took place. And what we've also found is that across the board, all persons, all officers of the court actually really like this tool when it's once it's used. As you've already stated, in the majority of cases, it's kind of an open and shut case. You know, the, a person will say that they did it and usually, I mean, there's really no need for a trial. Um, but in cases where it, it is uh, used as evidence, um, officers have reported that it, it, it 
um, helps in the courtroom with um, their integrity and their professionalism not being um, questioned. Mm -hmm. They they clearly don't have to, if, if, if for example, um, a defendant or if part of the defense is that officers were using harsh techniques or were being coercive, well, that can be seen in the courtroom. So a lot of this is mostly just to protect all citizens to ensure that they do receive the same treatment no matter where they're located, but also to protect officers to ensure that they, you know, can rely on the fact that they are using the best techniques and um, and then and even for prosecutors who can rely on it to ensure that if it is open and shut, then we don't have to go through the unnecessary process of a court proceeding. Right. We're I talking about false confessions. My guests are West Virginia University law professor Valina Beatty and from the Innocence Project attorney Ephioma Ike. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is the Law Works. Uh, I was just going to reaffirm that again. As a former prosecutor, it's an incredible tool to be able to actually have. Again, the defendant's own words right there. Uh, it helps in plea bargaining, and often you don't even need to go to trial for that. Well, and a prosecutor <laughs> has what is called prosecutorial discretion. The prosecutor can review the evidence in the case and decide whether, A, th the prosecutor thinks that a crime was committed, B, that this defendant was really involved in it, and C, whether the defendant ought to be prosecuted. I mean, certainly sometimes things happen, and you look at the case in its uh, totality, and you say, well, that was against the law, but no, we're not going to prosecute that. The prosecution would be unfair, or it wouldn't make sense, or the person really isn't going to do it again and doesn't deserve to be punished for whatever it was. I, I suppose it's like the man who steals a loaf of bread to feed his hungry children. Most prosecutors would look at that and say, we're not going to prosecute that but don't, don't you dare steal another loaf of bread, something like that, because it's a relatively minor offense, but it was committed for a good reason. Prosecutor can determine that. Also, in the old days, which are the current days in many places, when someone makes a statement to the police, when a suspect makes a statement, they may utter words. For example, I killed him. The problem with that is during the interview, they may have said, I killed him? I killed him, I killed him, or I killed him. Those are not equivalent statements, but when you write them down on paper, they look pretty much like the same thing. So, Valina, your project is working toward changing the law in West Virginia to do what? Uh, to have uniform policies across the state to record interrogations. And what you say really brings up for me uh, another group of people we haven't talked about, which is judges. And one of our lead real champions in this state, in West Virginia, for recording interrogations and bringing this into the courtroom is retired Judge O.T. Spaulding from Putnam County, Circuit Court Judge. And one of the things he says is that by recording, that means you can convict the guilty and also protect the innocent. So it's also a tool for the court itself. Uh, and I'll also just say, he makes the point and makes sure to say that you know, he's had a VCR since 1978 that this capacity has been around for a while. And it's time now with smartphones and with advanced technology that's a lot more affordable. It's time now to really step up and be able to do this to protect everyone. Yeah, your smartphone can record conferences, statements, interviews, and they're being used more and more. I thought they were telephones, but apparently they do a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like it's, it's a worthwhile activity, especially to define the parameters of interviews. I once uh, handled a case as a defense attorney where the defendant did in fact say, I killed him. And the officer came in with a transcript and said, I killed him, and was honest in the way that he represented the defendant's demeanor. However, the defendant said more than that. And I said to the officer, well, what was, what was her demeanor? What did she say before you took the statement? said, oh, she was crying, she was hysterical. She kept saying over and over again, I didn't mean to kill him, I didn't mean to kill him. I said, well, why isn't that in the statement that you just read to the jury? And he said, I hadn't turned my tape recorder on yet. Hmm. So we need rules to say this is when it starts, this is when it stops, this is the warnings you give, if any, this is the way you ask questions or whatever. Well, that's a big job. Good luck with it. Ifeoma, you came in from out of state for all of this. We appreciate that very much. Where, where are you working, your location? 
Uh, I'm downtown Manhattan in New York. Oh, you came from really out of town. <laughs> <laughs> I did, but I mean, I'm a, I'm a mountaineer, so. That's right, you attended WVU. I did, I did for undergrad and grad, so it was like home, literally. <laughs> Ifeoma Ike, Valina Beatty, thank you ladies for joining us. Thank you also for joining us. On behalf of the Law Works, I'm Dan Ringer. Good evening. If you would like to suggest a topic for a future The Law Works show, or if you're a school teacher and would like to receive a DVD of this show for classroom use, send us an email to thelawworks at comcast.net or visit us on Facebook. On The Law Works website at thelawworks.org, you'll find a listing of recent The Law Works programs, additional information about this show's topic, and video of this and recent shows. You can also find The Law Works programs on YouTube and iTunes. The Law Works is produced in cooperation with the Office of the West Virginia Attorney General, the West Virginia Bar Foundation, the Mountain State Bar, the Monongalia County Bar Association, and the West Virginia University College of Law. The Law Works is made possible by major grants from the Office of the West Virginia Attorney General, and from Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975 which provides high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems, as well as PC-based systems, and by a grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation. The West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and justice system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. Additional support for the law works is provided by the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.